Well, let us pray, shall we? Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this, for this passage this morning, that we, our ears will be open and that this preacher can preach your word faithfully and true. In these things we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, yes, it was a long reading, <laughs> but it's all tied together. And I think we can gather that. Just to clarify where we're up to in, in John's Gospel, there has been seven, seven signs, I had to count to seven, uh, seven signs, and the rising of Lazarus is the seventh of those. And then the Gospel changes, and it's all about the Passion. It's all about the Passion Week. So this is, uh, chapter 11 is almost, is, is like building up and saying, this, this friends, if you want to know who this Jesus is, I've given you seven signs and this is the seventh one. And friends, I want you to know that this man, Jesus, who I'm talking about, is the Christ, is the Messiah. And if you believe this, then you have life and life everlasting and you have the resurrection because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Such is the way that John has structured this book. So that's why we read all of John, John chapter 11 this morning. I want to structure this into, into four points, which spells out life. So there's late news, indescribable grief, faith, and then there's elation and envy. Um, Friends, can I just say, as we cover some of these topics, some things here may well disturb us. Uh, some people may well feel quite disturbed with, within yourselves. We pray that the Holy Spirit will bring comfort to your, to your hearts. Late news. Receiving a phone call from a hospice that a loved one is gravely ill creates all sorts of tension and emotion. In John 11, instead of a phone call, two travellers were dispatched from, fa from the family of Lazarus as, as his illness took a serious turn. They would have travelled for around about a day to where, to where Jesus was, and in their time of travel, Lazarus died. So, they, so the travellers didn't have any idea that Lazarus had died. They knew he was gravely ill to go and get the teacher. So they arrive and tell Jesus and the disciples of their knowledge that Lazarus is gravely ill and they were calling family and friends for the very imminent death. And Jesus knew supernaturally that Lazarus had actually already died. He told his disciples that Lazarus was asleep and that he was to go and then wake him up. There was some confusion about Jesus' words of asleep and, and uh, death. And uh, verses 12 and 13, Jesus says, uh, uh, Lord, if he sleeps, he, he will get better. The disciples said, and Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. Friends, how do you let someone know that there's been a death? How do you say that? We sometimes use words um, that have passed on. And we sort of go, passed on, oh, uh, that means, oh, I'm very sorry to hear. Or, they've gone. They've gone where? Um, he kicked the bucket, yeah. Or, they are no more. They are no more. What, what do you mean they are no more? What do you mean they've gone? What is this part? What are you talking about? Can you speak <laughs> plainly? We prefer to use those words because the same, because they have the same connotation. We almost have a fear of the word saying death or someone's died. There is a fear of, 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 of that word. And the fear is true. 
um, because the fear is, is separation. I've never been together again. I've been wrenched apart. Friends, I've conducted funerals where the family find comfort that their mum and dad or their nan and pa will again you be united again. But the Bible makes no promise of that. The Bible says that there is no marriage in heaven. The only marriage is between the bride and the groom. The bride being the church and the, and the groom is Christ. There was that story that, that Jesus spoke of, wasn't it? The seven husbands and the seven wives and, and, and the, no, the seven husbands and the, and the one wife. Who will be his husband? And Jesus said, well, there is no marriage in heaven. As for the destiny of those without Christ, there is no life outside of heaven. I've heard at the bedside when comfort will be given to each other that there's a better place, that their pain and their suffering has, has ended. But outside of Christ, that is uh, speculative at best. The only certainty in w is the words of Jesus that those who trust in him will have life and life eternal. That is the better place. But it is for those that trust in Christ as their Lord and Saviour. Friends, this, this is incredibly challenging and some of your emotions will, will be stirring and I certainly was stirred in my emotions as I was writing this to you in this week. Because we are talking about death. So then at the death of Lazarus, why does Jesus use this word, asleep? And then he says, I go to wake him. Well, friends, Jesus said these words because Jesus is life and brings life to the full. He brings life eternal for those that believe in him. It's just like Jesus going, to, going up to Lazarus and give him a shake on the, sh shake on the shoulder. Come on, it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. The slumber is over. Now it's time to wake, for the Lord of life has called you to wake up. You see, physical death for the Christian is when, when the soul parts from the body, from the physical body, and the soul returns to God who gave it. And then there will come a time when... when when the dead in Christ will rise first, as we heard this morning when Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, to give comfort to, to those who, who were saying, well, what happens to those who die? We're still living. We know that Christ is going to come back. And they were thinking imminently. He will come back one day. And when he does, the dead in Christ will rise first. And then those who are living will be caught up together. And there the body and the soul will, will, will be joined together once again. We are, if you want to say this word, uh, we are embodied souls currently here, aren't we? The whole reason John has written this, this gospel is that to drawing faith, is to point people to Christ. See, this is what John is writing about. He's saying, I, I, want, I want you to, to be instilled with faith. I want you to see past the present, past the physical, what you can gather at the moment. I want you to look beyond that, to look upwards, to look for Christ. But there is indescribable grief because there is a separation. The words used for grief being expressed is gut-wrenching. It is a grief that sucks everything out of you. You shake on the inside and the outside. You are unable to sleep or be awake. It is consuming, all-consuming. It is indescribable and it can last for a short time, a long time, 
And it comes in waves of anger and frustration and numbness and unable to function and exhaustion. Within all of this, many of many of you have got to then try and prepare a funeral or give a eulogy in this mass of messed up lives and stuff going on and exhaustion and separation. The grief is unbearable. It is indescribable. And John picks this up in, his, in this passage. Mary and Martha, two sisters, the two sisters of Lazarus, they were together with their close friends. They were experiencing this grief over, over the death of Lazarus. Martha, she was out walking around. She couldn't sit still. She was out walking around. Interesting how two sisters who grew up in the same house, completely different responses. Martha walked. Mary sat and received mourners as they came to express their grief to them. And those mourners then expressed the same grief as what Mary did with, with loud wailing. You see, the funeral had been and gone. In the Middle East at that time, uh, it is hot, very hot. And the corpse begins its, de uh, his, its uh, decomposition immediately. And the best way to prevent smell and disease is for the corpse to be entombed within the day. So as the people with, with the message had been dispatched to Jesus, Lazarus had died and been buried, put into a tomb on that same day. And so the sisters were then left with receiving mourners and tending to the place where Lazarus was entombed. And the mourners would then mirror the, the intensity of the wailing of the sisters. They would share in their grief. Listen carefully to how John has recorded this. Verse 28 following. You know, Martha went back and called her sister Mary. The teacher is here and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now that Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still in the place where Mary, Martha had met him. And when the Jews had been there, who had been there with Mary in the house comforting her, notice how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. And when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and, saw, and said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? Come and see. Jesus wept. Then the, Jews, then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Friends, the, the weeping of Jesus is contrasted with the, the loud wailing of the mourners. He was deeply grieved. He was deeply grieved because his friends, whom he deeply loved, they were grieving. Don't ever think that Jesus is far off and so far removed that he has no knowledge of what it is to grieve. He knows what it is to grieve. He was at his friend's grave and he wept. And he wept with his friends because they were grieving. And we must understand, friends, that, that God is not impersonal. He knows what it means to grieve and to be heartbroken because he was there he experienced it but then Jesus also knew that he didn't wail like Mary and Martha and the example of given to others he was deeply grieved and he wept 
Not because that was the end. But he knew what was going to happen next. That glory for the Lord was, was going to happen next. So he calls for faith. Faith. Where was this going to end? Well, this is the question Jesus asked Martha when he first arrived. In verse 21, um, Martha asked Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will ask, God will give you what, whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Mary answered, uh, Martha answered, I know he will rise again at the resurrection of the last day. And this is his famous verse, verses. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will never die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Mary, Martha had the idea that if Jesus... If Jesus had been there, then the Lazarus' illness could have been healed. She knew this. We've already seen in John that illnesses can be cured from, from a distance. We'd seen that was one of the signs. This, 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 um, this very important man whose son was ill and who came to Jesus and said, can you, heal my, can you come back with me? And Jesus said, your son is healed. And so he went back. And when he found out what time it was, it was the exact time was when Jesus said those words. So Jesus can cure from a distance. So why let Lazarus die? It seemed inconceivable, doesn't it? If Jesus has all this power and can do all these things and can work all these things, why has Lazarus died? Why? Why not fix him? Why not make him better? Why couldn't he have just said, Lazarus, be healed? Why couldn't he do that? The situation seems irretrievable. Jesus, though, was seeking to teach them and us today through this sign of resurrection from the dead. He asked Martha if she believed. And she said, I do. I, I know who you are. I know that you are the Christ. I know that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. All these words that, that John keeps on repeating. Martha believed this and she said this. She, she made this confession. But she also saw in the present that there was a stone, a big rock in front of a tomb, because that's where Lazarus was, dead. She believed in the resurrection, as did the Pharisees. She believed that at the end of the age, there would be a general resurrection. However, Jesus had something else to show her and us that Christ is the resurrection and the life. And this was the sign that instructs our faith. And verses 38 following, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone. But Lord, Martha said, and the sister of the dead man, by this time there is going to be a, well, it's going to be a bit smelly. He's been there for four days. The decomposition is going to be working its things. I don't want to be all drawn into what that's going to look like. Whew. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone with their hats or their noses. 
<laughs> then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know I knew that you would always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you have sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and his feet wrapped in strips of linen. Friends, he didn't come out with legs individually wrapped. Because why would you? He was dead. He's not going to walk again. So don't worry about wrapping your legs individually. He would have been wrapped together. How did he come out of the, the tomb? Like he... <laughs> I don't know how he came out of the tomb. Some have called this uh, another miracle that literally Lazarus rose and came out of the tomb, like alive. Just picture that for a little bit. And Jesus said to him, I said to them, uh, take off the grave clothes, can you? Like, let him. He's alive. You can at least get him to walk and let him go. Uh, this is the sign that teaches us that physical death is not the important thing. One commentator, Leon Morris, writes this. For the unbeliever, death may be thought of as the end. Pause here. Today, what? Um, Warney has been a funeral for Warney. For many, that is the end. The end of the spin king. We have another king. The king of kings and the lord of lords. He is the end. He is the talos, the talios, what is the, the, the end of our faith. For Christ is, is the point where we look towards. Come back to Leon Morris. For the unbeliever, death may be thought of as the end. Not so for those who believe in Christ. They may die, they may die in the sense that they pass through the door we call physical death. But they will not die in the fuller sense. Death for them is but the gateway to further life and fellowship with God. This transcends the Pharisaic view of a remote resurrection at the end of time. It means that the moment we put our trust in Jesus, we begin to experience that life of the age to come, which cannot be touched by death. When you come to Jesus and say, I believe that you are my Lord and I confess with my mouth, and believe in my heart that you are my Lord and Saviour, the age to come, you enter at that point. Leon Morris again. Jesus is bringing Martha a present gift, not simply the promise of a future good. We live, each of us who are believers in Christ, you have started life eternal, but you've still got physical life at the moment. And what does it say that, that our souls are, 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 are safe in the arms of Jesus? None who have ever been, none will be lost who are put into my hand. That was the good shepherd last week. None will be lost. They are in my hands and I will not lose any. Because what the Father has given to me, I hold precious. I hold precious. You are the apple of my eye, the Psalms write. You are the apple of my eye. None will be lost. We've got to treasure these words. Hold on to these words. They are, they are, they are, in, they are held in heaven where no moth, no rust Nothing can ever attack them. That's where we, that's where our future is. 
And they are precious in the arms of Jesus, in the hands of Jesus. None will be lost, for I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. What a sign. What a gift. What a sight. We've already heard recently of a, a lame man walking, a blind man seeing. Now we have a dead man living. Elation and envy. Verse 45. Therefore many of the Jews had come to visit Mary had seen what Jesus did and put their faith in him. There was great elation for many who were, who were there. To see someone healed is, well, that, that's pretty special. To see a man who'd been in a tomb for four days now living and walking and talking and eating with them. Wow, that just tops it all. With that, they put their faith and trust in Jesus for what he had said about himself, that he is the resurrection and the life. His actions matched his words and they believed. It's interesting, later in John, in fact, the very next chapter, chapter 12, that's because of, because of Lazarus having living again, that, the, that many wanted to go and kill Lazarus. Because many seeing Lazarus were saying, I can see you and I believe in Jesus. I see you and I believe in Jesus. Lazarus would have lived for some time after that and eventually he would have died of whatever causes it would have been. Lazarus, as well as, we, as, as well as all who believe in Christ, while well, he would die a physical death, he lives because he believes in Christ and Christ is the life and Christ gives eternal life. Even though he died, he lives and he lives forever. My well, friends, the opposite of elation is envy, and there was much. The envy came from those closely aligned with who were the religious leaders that were in opposition to Christ. They went and told uh, all that had happened in the, in the interest uh, and, and, and all the interest and belief that was being spoken of and seen in Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ. The planning to kill Jesus began with earnest. We must kill Jesus. We must eliminate this Jesus because he's giving us a terrible time. The Apostle John, the writer of this, was closely connected with the workings of the temple and many of decisions made. So John was made aware of this discussion Listen, we could get a little bit of a, uh, can we say, someone sitting at the table or a fly on the wall. Could we use that expression? Verse 47. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we go on like this, no, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them named Caphias, who was the high priest that Jesus spoke up, you know nothing at all. You do not realise, uh, you, you do not realise that it's better for, for you that one man die for the people and the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God. Insert here, even here in Mount Evelyn, to bring them together and to make them one. So from that day on, they plotted, they plotted to take his life. The plots to have Jesus killed while evil in, 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 evil 
in intent, where in fact the very plans of God. The Son of God must go to Jerusalem. This is what Jesus said to the disciples many times. I must go to Jerusalem. I must be handled over, handed over to evil men who then must crucify me. Having killed him, being the big plan of what the Sanhedrin was thinking of, having killed him, their plan was then the followers would then simply disperse. The head would be cut off the snake, using that expression. They will be, they'll, be, they'll get their power back, everything will just return to normal. And then the followers of Jesus of Nazareth would be silenced. But, this is the big but, they forgot one thing. Christ, Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. Just as he raised Lazarus from the grave, so Christ will be raised, for, raised to life forever as the first in the new creation. Friends, you and I, we live in the fulfilled promise of the resurrection of what is to come. Amen. We need to pray. Father God, we thank you that your son died on a cross. Actually, come back from that. We thank you, Lord, that your son was born of a virgin, Mary. That your son lived a life that is perfect without sin and that on the cross he died for our sin he took our sin upon himself and father we thank you that his his life was found to be without blemish and therefore was raised to life on the day third and we stand father here because we believe in Jesus of Jesus Christ who is who was who was the raised who was the resurrected Christ who who reigns eternal who who ascended to heaven and father from there rules all things in whose name all authority has been given to and father we thank you that we stand on the promises of God which are found and perfected in Christ. And so, Lord, we give you thanks for this and we give praise for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.